11 years ago with your son Matthew, Tim Healy. So, Tim, you've known each other for a long time. Was it a breathless teenage romance? No. <laughs> no, we met about 22 years ago, and uh, our first meeting, really, we, we weren't very sure about each other at all. Um, I thought she was a bit of a flirt. <laughs> and she thought I was a miserable git. <laughs> and uh, we auditioned together at the Live Theatre, and then uh, we met in 1988 at a, a friend's dinner party. Uh, it was New Year's Eve night, wasn't it? Yep. And I made a steak and kidney pie. And that won me over. That was it. <laughs> You've been eating out of his hand ever since. Absolutely. That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, Denise, uh, your reign as the Rovers' favourite femme fatale, Natalie Barnes, is the latest in a string of television successes. Here's how you earned your street cred. Promise me you'll have an absolutely smashing fun. I'm dead nervous. I've never done anything like this before, you know. Well, the bank manager's never lent you any money before either. So it'll be a first time for both of you. Yeah. Do you want to eat with us? We've got pizzas. Oh, I thought I could smell warm cardboard. I didn't take the money, so why should I pay it back? Very well. Mrs. Stubbs, on the basis of the facts presented to me, you are now the subject of a regimental inquiry. So, how about my place? What do you mean? I think you know what I mean. Natalie? Yeah? was a flash git. Shut up. Let me come in. Look, next time, I've got a Shelby face in the bar. <laughs> Well, all those disgraceful goings-on in Coronation Street help it to top the ratings with 16 million viewers per episode. Now, Bruce Jones, as uh, Les Battersby, you're a Rovers regular. What is your view of the landlady? I think she's brilliant, because ever since she's taken that pub over, I've not bought a drink. <laughs> and I know Vicky, who plays my wife, has made a, a great friendship with Denise, and uh, we all love her dearly, very Thank dearly. Thank you very much. It's brilliant. Thank you. Well, one of your early breaks on television came when you played Frances Spender, the wife of a maverick copper. Let's hear now from the big spender himself, oh. Jimmy Nail. Hello, pet. <laughs> Can you remember when we did Spender, Denise? And uh, you always used to give me a hard time about the scenes I used to write where you were in the kitchen making tea. I got so fed up with it that I eventually blew you up. <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me for that. And remember this. I recently saw a movie in which a guy said to another guy, it's not what you want, it's what you settle for. Don't settle for anything other than the best, pet. All right. So, Jacqueline Denise Welch, this is your life. And you first stole the limelight on the 22nd of May, 1958, at Preston Hospital, Tynemouth. You were the first of two daughters for Anne and Vincent Welch. Your mother was a nurse, and when you were born, your dad was studying economics at King's College, Newcastle, before joining the family business, Welsh's Toffees. <laughs> There's you, displaying a fine pair of milk teeth. <laughs> and Vin, from an early age, Denise showed dramatic flair. Oh, yeah, she was always a bit of a drama queen from being very young, Michael. And I remember taking her to the doctors once. And while I was talking to the doctor, telling him what the problem was, she climbed onto his couch and lay down, and he went over and said, Well, how are you today, Denise? And she laid back and said, Constipated. Still <laughs> 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 uh, Debbie, when you were small, you used to watch every week to see who was given the big red book. That's right, Michael. When we were children, uh, I was quite relieved to be readily seated this evening because, Denise, we used to watch it when it was presented by Eamon Andrews. And um, she must have had an idea of where her future was going then because she used to say, Debbie, when I'm on This Is Your Life, it was never if, it was always when I'm on This Is Your Life. <laughs> and you walk through those doors. I'm just going to turn to the presenter and just say, I'm sorry, I have no idea who this woman is. <laughs> Oh, 
you're raised in Woodley Road, Monk's Eaton, and you go to Bygate Primary School. Uh, there you are, on an early theatrical outing as a young uh, <laughs> moggy. And uh, a snap of you... When I was a boy, I had a sex change. <laughs> Now, the closest you get to stardom as a schoolgirl is watching your stage-struck dad, a prize-winning pub entertainer. Uh, <laughs> his cabaret routine involves dressing up as Shirley Bassey or Marlena Dietrich. That obviously didn't put you off show business. Well, it didn't. I mean, the thing is, I mean, I, I've said this before, that I just got used to the fact that my dad dressed as a woman. Deborah used to be horrified by this fact, but I just used to show people photos saying, this is my dad at a charity do, and I could see them visibly backing out the room, you know, because he did Shirley Bassey. Bassey, Dolly Parton, everybody, all with a broad Geordie accent, but he, he looked look the part. <laughs> but because of your dad's connections in entertainment, the Welshies had lots of theatrical friends. One of them used to stay with the family whenever he was working in Newcastle. It is your honorary uncle, likely lad Rodney Bewes. <laughs> Tell us about the old days there. Well, we used to go up to Whitley Bay because Ian Lafrenier that wrote The Likey Lads with his partner Dick Clement, his mother lived at one end of Woodley Road, Monk Seat in Whitley Bay, and uh, Vin and Anne lived at the other end. And uh, over the years, Ian would get a different car, and it was a red Sunbeam Alpine first, and then a, a green TR4, and then an E-type Jaguar. And once this open-top car, we took Denise and her sister Deborah to the seafront and had a drive along the seafront. When we got back to their house, Denise got out this car. You knew she was going to be an actress, and she was about five. She got out this open-top car, and she said, Ah, well, back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. In 1970, you spend a year at La Sagesse Convent, and then you go on to Concert Grammar. Your best friend there was Jill Heald. Now, the drama teacher at your grammar school was the founder of Concert Theatre Workshop, Terry Cudden. And, Terry, you spotted Denise's talent straight away. Well, it was obvious, because Denise only came to school for the drama. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she decided in those days that she would become a drama teacher. But um, it took very little persuasion for her to apply to drama school. And this is the result. Yeah, he was my mentor. I owe it all to Terry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, indeed, at 18, you moved to London to take up a place at Mount View Theatre School. And your hair soon became the talk of the school. <laughs> your best friend at Mount View, Rosemary Hurst. <laughs> So, Rosemary, did Denise have bad hair days? Um, she had lots of bad hair days. Um, Denise used to dye her hair every colour that you could think of. ...as to what colour it would be. And eventually I said to her, look, why don't you just go back to your natural colour? And she went, well, I would, Rose, but I can't remember what it I is. <laughs> <laughs> but we became the best of friends. In fact, such good friends that you did try to steal my identity. When she went up for the audition for Marsha Stubbs in Soldier, Soldier, they were a little bit worried, because obviously she's a Geordie and the role was for a Mancunian. So she went, oh, no, you don't understand. My parents live in Parbold, a little Lancashire village. I went to Wigan Girls High. <laughs> Terrifying because they came from Parbold, the people <laughs> audition. Anyway, you've been my best mate ever since. You're a brilliant actress, a brilliant friend, and I just love you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. After drama school, you start your career in children's theatre. You also do a bit of thigh slapping as principal boy in pantomime. And in 1982, you make your West End debut at the Astoria Theatre as Ruby, one of the chicks in the Lieber and Stoller musical Yakety Yak, along with your friend Eve Ferret. Also starring in the show are the acting clan McGann, and we'll hear from one of them now. Taking a break from filming Heartbeat, Joe McGann. Um, cast your mind back to 1982. Remember this? This show, Yakka to Yak, is like still, I think, like one of the best times I've ever had anywhere doing this job. It was just the most fantastic fun on stage. It was a big live rock and roll musical, the like of which has been seen since, but not before. We were like the first to do it. And we had so much fun. We were at the Astoria Theatre in the West End, and I remember that we all moved into the same dressing room practically. Do you remember? There was like kind of 20 dressing rooms in the place, and we just end up in the one. 
I had fantastic fun doing that, and I hope you have fantastic fun tonight, babe. All right? So have a great, great time. See ya. See you soon. And love to Tim. Bye -bye. The year after that, you follow up with another musical playing Sandy Dombrowski in the 60s hit Grease. Three years later, you return to your native Newcastle to work on three plays for the Live Theatre Company, directed by Max Roberts. Max, they were, they were very different from West End musicals. Yes, uh, gritty northern drama, Denise, <laughs> and hideous frocks, as I remember. But she really is, you know, a fabulous actress. Great range, great emotional range, great comic timing, and I love her very much. Have you have enough fab night, Denise. Thank you, Max. <laughs> now, one night in 1988, you're relaxing on Newcastle's floating disco, the Tuxedo Princess, and there That's it was true. that Tim Healy offers you his hand. Did he use a line of Noel Cowards? No, it was just, are you going to marry us or what? Flam <laughs> <laughs> it was some private lives, wasn't it? Yeah. As you do. As you do. <laughs> It worked, but it worked. Yeah, a little while later. I didn't say yes at the time, did no, I? No, no. But well, eventually you graciously accept. Yeah. And um, to make sure of things, there are two ceremonies. First at Haringey Register Office in London on October the 18th, 1988, followed by tea at the Ritz. And then on October the 23rd, there's a blessing at St John's in Berkeley, where Tim's parents have been married. And Debbie was your bridesmaid. Your son Matthew was born the following year. Now, Matthew, when we did your dad's life a couple of years ago, you told us you wanted to be a pop star. How's all that coming along? Well, since then, well, I've been playing the drums and um, I've got quite good progress on that. And I'd really like to be a top-class musician, basically. Yeah. Buy mum a new mansion, Bel Air Mansion in Los Angeles. Excellent. In her dreams. <laughs> well, I happen to know that you are already the new Buddy Rich, and especially for your mum, here is a, a paradiddle tap that you prepared earlier, Matthew, with a little help from your cousins. Now, Denise, although things were going well for you, you begin to suffer from postnatal depression, and it was to signal... Can you recall how it first showed itself? Yeah, I mean, it was about, <coughs> excuse me, a week after Matty was born, and um, everything had been fine, I was breastfeeding fine, went to bed, had a panic attack, didn't know what it was, whole lactation process stopped, went to bed, Jane Mansfield woke up as Twiggy, and, um, <laughs> and then this sort of horrible lost all sense of reality and didn't know quite what was happening to me and mum who'd been a nurse said you feel depressed and I said no n not quite anyway it then went on to really gain momentum and after about two hours I was really in a very very bad way so I've just tried to sort of champion the cause really because I just think that if I could get it anybody could get it. In 1989 you step in to take over the leading role in the, A Nightingale Sang for the live theatre company after the principal actress injures her back. <laughs> Now, Philippa Wilson, you were in the cast, and Denise took over at very short notice. Yeah, well, we were all in a bit of a panic, and uh, Max persuaded Denise to come in and take over, which she did very calmly, uh, had a couple of rehearsals, and then went on that night reading from the script. Uh, the part she was playing was a very staunch Catholic mother, and uh, the audience didn't actually realise she was reading from the script. She did such a good, convincing part that uh, they actually thought she was carrying a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, uh, it was only a couple of years later that we actually realised that she'd been sort of at the height of the postnatal depression, which she wouldn't have known because she did it with great ease and good humour, and she saved the day. And I think it just shows her huge gutsiness and, and sheer professionalism, and she's absolutely brilliant, and I love you dearly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, in 1990, you appear in the BBC Tea Time serial Biker Grove. You play one of the grown-ups outnumbered by a cast of child actors. And, Denise, we still blame you for all of our terrible marks in maths. <laughs> it's PJ and Duncan from Biker Grove and, and Deck. <laughs> And uh, enumerate, uh -huh. uh, if you can. Well, uh, in Bite Go, the majority of the cast were under 16, uh, including us at the time. And we used to miss a lot of schoolwork, so we had to do a lot of homework on the set of Bite Grove. And uh, bizarrely, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the older cast members wanted to help us out, including Denise. That's right, Denise used to come in, and uh, <laughs> Denise would give us help, help with uh, our maths. Whether we wanted help or not, Denise used to give us help with our maths. <laughs> 
very kindly, though, I'm, we're very appreciative, uh, and needless to say, um, thanks to all of Denise's help, you know, we, we didn't become top-class mathematicians, <laughs> had to run off and become pop stars instead, unfortunately. <laughs> but no, Denise, have a great night. Oh, thank you very much. So, thank you, Dan. Thanks, Roy. <laughs> In 1991, you star in The Godmother, a television play set in a block of Newcastle council flats. And your next-door neighbour was played by an old friend. Why, I pet. As you can <laughs> hear, Nies, my accent hasn't improved at all. Not your average, Geordie. Ruler Lenska. Oh, This was uh, unusual casting. Yes, it was only thanks to Denise that I got the part. Uh, I mean, a, a working-class Geordie housewife is... Uh... Well, that's what they said to me, because when I got this part, she was a really sort of... She was quite a rough-and-ready Geordie housewife, and they said, and your next-door neighbour is a rough-and-ready Geordie housewife. And I said, oh, who's playing her? And they said, oh, Polish Countess Rula Lenska. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember one of the newspaper critics said that I had the worst Birmingham accent they'd ever heard. <laughs> and one of the papers said, if it had just become a cult. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that not only are you a smashing, talented and beautiful friend that I don't see very often, but I feel that I can call on at any time and we'll just pick up where we left off. Oh, thanks, Ru. Ruler, thank you very much. In the mid-90s, you appear in three series of Soldier, Soldier, playing the Sergeant Major's wife, Marcia Stubbs. And one of your mates from that show is now playing the street's crusher Ferguson, John Bowen. <laughs> you know, Michael, the most nervous I think I've ever been in my career was, apart from now, was um, <laughs> when I was stood on the uh, hallowed cobbles outside the Rover's Return playing my first scene in Coronation Street. And I can tell you I was very relieved and delighted that I was looking into the eyes of one of the most committed and sensitive and supportive actresses that I can think of. I know we didn't play together Who very much. It was <laughs> you. <laughs> I know we didn't play together very much in uh, Soldier, Soldier, but uh, I hope in the months, who knows, maybe years to come, that we'll play with each other a lot more. I hope so. <laughs> then, Soldier Soldier, your character became a, a nightclub singer, and the reaction is so good in real life, you release a single of the Dusty Springfield hit, mm -hmm. You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. Oh, my God. in that video included, of course, Tim and Matthew and another close friend, novelist and TV agony aunt, Denise Robertson. <laughs> Denise, you've worked together again recently, haven't you? We have, because she is generous with that most precious of all things, her time. And if I don't dare cry. <laughs> A few weeks ago, she gave up one of her precious weekends to come and read the leading role in my first stage play. I was terrified, but when you got hold of that script, it came to life. And oh, thank you. You're like the yeast in a loaf, I think. You, your enthusiasm gets in there and makes things happen. 
and you're what we call a canny burn. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Your chance to join the world's longest running soap opera comes in 1997. As a Weatherfield regular, one of your big storylines was your romance with Bookie Des Barnes. But I'm afraid you were the kiss of destinies. Only a few weeks after your screen wedding, Des was stabbed in a brawl with drug dealers. And here is a poignant scene from his last moments. We're shouting, Mrs. Barnes. I love you, Mrs. Barnes. <laughs> Bigger. Now prepare for a shock. Thanks to the magic of television, we've managed to bring Des back to life. <laughs> and he's here along with your wayward son, Tony, Phil Middlemiss, and Lee Warburton. Oh! So, Phil, yours was a whirlwind romance. Yes, it was, Michael. Uh, we met and got together, got engaged, got married, and I was dead within six weeks. <laughs> so, I, I always remember the deathbed scene, though. Um, Des was telling Natalie, because he was an old romantic, about taking her to Blackpool, and uh, my last line was, uh, Oh, Natalie, I'd love to take you up the tower. <laughs> Which really... <laughs> really made myself and Denise laugh. Uh, 45 minutes later, we actually got the scene done. So, those tears you see... Are actually oh. uh, laughter, not Can you brief. imagine trying to play crying scenes with Phil Middlemus? It was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but Lee, your character Tony Horrocks caused Des's death and brought your screen mother a lot of grief. Yeah, but that was just the storyline. I mean, on set, the crew reckoned it was more like Terry and June. And at it the was. End of <laughs> they used to call it Life with the Bonds, as like it was a sitcom. <laughs> and at the end of every scene, we used to play like Canned Laughter in the theme tune. Lovely, sickening, really. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Now, Jesse's funeral was a big day for your real-life dad, too, because he played your father-in-law. Go on, ask her. Go on, she can tell you. But, oh, no, she'd rather save a rotten son. Control yourself, man, can't you? Don't worry. I can't stick any more of this. Well, then, after 40 years in Toffee, that must have been quite a moment for you. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a moment, Michael. I'd only been a professional actor for about three years after leaving the Toffee business when I landed that uh, role. And it was really quite exciting, of course, but I remember sitting in the church and the camera being on Denise and myself and thinking, I can't believe that I was, three years ago, I was selling Toffees, and now I'm in coordination Street with Denise, and it was really one of the most exciting and emotional was, moments of my life. Emotional. Yeah. Quality Street, really. Indeed. <laughs> Now, Brian Park, you were the producer who brought Denise onto the street. Was that a shrewd move? Yes, well, uh, at the time I took over Coronation Street, we were looking for a figure, a, a new Elsie Tano figure, so we were looking for a big, brassy, blonde bombshell, so we obviously cast against type and went for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's almost time to adjourn to the Rovers, but not quite. As a little girl of six, you'd dream that one day you'd star in Coronation Street. Those ambitions were fuelled by a friend of the family, a comedy writer who used to take you and your sister Debbie out for jaunts in his shining motor cars. Since those days, he's gone on to fame and fortune in Hollywood, but he's flown in from Los Angeles to congratulate you tonight. Ian Lafrenet. <laughs> Well-crafted lines, if you could. Well, the funny thing is, she's going to Los Angeles on <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> well, I think my biggest thrill, you know, knowing Denise since she was a baby, uh, and then when she became an actress was when we worked together. First of all, Alfreda Zempe, and then Spender. It was very special to be 
in a rehearsal hall surrounded by lots of actors. And uh, I think she said to me, can you believe this? And I said, don't you dare call me uncle. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's a party tonight, the same thing applies. All right, uncle Ian. Uh, I love her for being a terrific actress, but mostly I love her for being Denise. Thank you. Janine's leading Frank a dance while Teresa is devoting herself to the Free Matthew campaign. East Ender. Using our transport system and roads, Crime Squad's after you next on BBC One.